Thank you. So, good morning. <clears throat> nice to see at least a few still here so early in the morning uh, of the last day. Now, uh, <clears throat> we made it yesterday until uh, here. So, we still discussed a couple of things uh, concerning inflation. In particular, I tried uh, to explain um, the uh, horizon problem in a way which I hope was transparent. And, uh, but I think it's, uh, this business with the horizons is confusing, and I think it's really important that you carefully uh, think about that yourself. So therefore, why I discussed it, and I gave also these pictures from the uh, review by uh, Baumann. Now, uh, <coughs> I will, what I will do today is, well, I, uh, I will discuss a few simple things, just a few basic formulae which we need hopefully in a compact way, so that you uh, have them. Uh, for, for those who see them maybe for the first time and for the others who have seen them, uh, know them already, a little bit as a, a reminder. Now, uh, <clears throat> what, what we'll discuss, I mean, the key reference here, references here concern two classes of models for inflation. One, uh, the so-called large field models of inflation. And one is the Starobinsky model, which I will discuss later. And one is this uh, chaotic inflation by Linde, sort of one of, or maybe the standard model for inflationary cosmology. Also important is this one here, uh, natural, so-called natural inflation, which has to do with the flat direction, which you get from axion field, and uh, some potential generated not perturbatively. I will not discuss much about that, but I just mention it here. Then what will be important for us is hybrid inflation, and I will spend some time uh, on that. <coughs> then for reviews here, much of that is in standard textbooks. I listed, I think, two very good books here, and I particularly recommend this uh, review by Daniel Baumann, which you can just download. I think it's very good. Now, uh, The dynamics of inflation is uh, a slowly rolling scalar field that maybe you have seen. And everybody who had a course in uh, general relativity knows how to deal with uh, scalar fields in curved space time. So uh, you know you have a certain action, and then you have a Lagrangian, which in the simplest case is just a real scalar with some potential. Then what is important is uh, to have the energy momentum tensor for that, and uh, then there's a standard way uh, to derive that once you have the action. And then, uh, you know, we assume in the robertson walker metric a certain geometry, which is, uh, well, uh, the following. You have sort of the, the, the space time we are looking at is, say, R, the real axis corresponding to time, times a maximally symmetric uh, three-dimensional space, which is either open, uh, closed, or flat, and uh, if you now have some, um, so that's for the metric, and that gives us the robertson walker metric, and then you also have, uh, of course, a source for this metric, and which via the Einstein equations um, determines the metric, and that's the energy momentum tensor, and that, of course, has to have the same symmetries as what we assume for the metric. And that gives you the sort of fluid form of the energy momentum tensor. And that means the uh, entire energy momentum tensor is determined in terms of two entries, as for uh, we had it before, namely energy density, which is, uh, say, the potential, uh, the kinetic term, and the gradient energy, and uh, a pressure, which is essentially the same, but with a very important minus sign here for the scalar field. Now, we will always assume homogeneous scalar fields. Here, so that means we drop the gradient term, and then you have phi dot squared plus v and phi dot squared minus v. And you see if the kinetic terms are small, then uh, rho is essentially minus p. And that's the equation of state which we need for exponential uh, expansion. And therefore, scalar field dynamics can realize what we want, what we discussed yesterday for this shrinking Hubble sphere. That's the essence. Uh, of that. So we have now two sets of field equations. We have uh, the Einstein equations, which for this geometry boil down to uh, the Friedman equations. And then we have an equation for uh, the scalar field, which is this. 
And you see, uh, it's, a, it's the usual equation which we have for a scalar field in Minkowski space, plus this term, which is a friction term. It is uh, proportional to the first derivative of the field. And the Hubble uh, uh, parameter acts as a friction. And that is, if you derive this equation of motion, it comes from the volume term here. Now, uh, <clears throat> what you can easily check yourself, if you haven't done it yourself so far, is the following. Uh, you can have so-called slow roll solutions of these field equations, which are characterized uh, by uh, the following. Uh, the kinetic term is small compared to the potential, and the modulus of the second uh, time derivative is small compared to the force term here and compared to the friction term. So you can drop that. And then uh, you get, in fact, uh, two equations, which I've uh, written down here. You get from the um, scalar field equation, just this remains. And in the Friedman equation, you get this. This is the Friedman equation just with the potential, because in the energy density, uh, the kinetic energy does not contribute. And what you can also check easily yourself is that these conditions are equivalent, that you can write them as conditions on the first and the second derivative of the potential. So these are the so-called uh, slow roll conditions. You have a quantity epsilon, which in units of the Planck mass is the first derivative of the potential over the potential squared. And the other is eta, which is the second derivative of the potential, the modulus of that. And in units of the Planck mass, both have to be very small. So these three, this is the uh, starting point for inflationary cosmologists. So you see it's very easy if you make the want a model of the world yourself. You just take two differential equations of first order and solve them, put in some potential, and play some games. And once you have the code, you can even download, of course, such codes from the internet. It's not very difficult. But interesting. So now, one example, and I think that was first really studied with some of the physical applications by Linda many years ago, is uh, just a power here. And uh, just the power. And of course, depending on what the power is, uh, the dimension of the coupling varies. And uh, then you get these large field inflation models. And they have a very uh, simple structure. They always look like this. You have a potential. And you have the field. And the potential looks something like this. And the field rolls down here, and from some value, say phi star, it's usually called, until some end value. So-called end of inflation. And in fact, end of inflation uh, is defined by saying that the slow roll conditions no longer hold. You can see that then uh, the period of exponential uh, expansion stops. Now, uh, so you have something like this, these so-called large field inflation models, they are large, for reasons which we will see uh, in a minute. Uh, you can, given such a potential, you can easily work out, uh, for this example, the relevant quantities which uh, characterize inflationary models. The first is the amount of expansion. As we saw, during uh, inflation, you have an exponential growth of the scale factor. So if you start from some value A, which corresponds to this field value here, then uh, you blow up. And uh, this growth is always characterized by the number of e-folds. So you write that growth as a uh, factor e to the n. And then uh, you can write this n clearly as uh, like this, the number of e-folds. Uh, as an integral over the Hubble parameter. The Hubble parameter now is a function of the field because it depends on the potential, which depends on the field. And uh, you can then rewrite it like this, the potential of the derivative of the potential. And for this particular example of the power potential, you just get phi squared over Planck squared times 2 over 1 over 2p. And uh, <clears throat> so. You see, if you, for, if you need n e-folds, and we will see, for reasons of that I have no time to discuss, you need typically 50 or 60. It depends on the maximum temperature which you have in the universe. 
so for this uh, range, you see that in fact this value of phi is pretty big. It is bigger than the Planck mass. So inflation with this kind of potentials uh, drives you to transplankian field values. That's at the moment a hot topic in research, whether that is consistent, what one can think about it, and how you can realize that in various models. And, but for these models, uh, that's a fact. Now, uh, in fact, qualitatively, in order to reach these 60, 50, or 60 e folds, you can do two things. Either you take, say, a potential as I had it, this uh, uh, phi to the p, which is flat, but not that flat. And uh, then um, you are driven to these very large field values. The other possibility is to have a potential which is even flatter, a kind of plateau potential. Then you can reach, uh, for smaller field values, these number of efforts. These are the so-called small field models to which I will come. Then <laughs> there are two indices related to this slow roll parameters, uh, two linear combinations, which I've given here. We will see on the next slide why they are important. That's the uh, scalar and the tensor spectral index, here always given as a power, uh, independent, uh, dependent on uh, the power of P. There's another quantity R. Uh, why this is written like that, you cannot understand from here. It comes with something which I will tell you on the next slide. But it is just uh, this quantity, which is 16 epsilon, the so-called tensor to scalar ratio. But uh, this uh, spectral indices and uh, this value of R are the key quantities which you always work out in models of inflation and which are needed to compare with data. That's why I just uh, repeat them here. Now, now we come back uh, to this uh, microwave background. And you know you have this uh, enormous uh, information on uh, the fluctuations. We saw that. You saw that picture many times. Just a beautiful picture. I can always look at it again. And the latest, and from that, you uh, extract a so-called power spectrum. Now, uh, just a second. I cannot uh, really explain how one gets from this picture to the spectrum. That's, uh, of course, uh, the key business in, uh, inflationary, in inflationary model building. And uh, that's, uh, I think, one of the most beautiful aspects, namely how you generate from quantum fluctuations uh, these classical uh, anisotropies in uh, temperature and in other uh, things. And uh, that the first calculation of this kind was done by uh, Shibisov and Mukhanov many years ago. And I think this is really a very beautiful thing. But I mean, how you really get, first of all, how you calculate these quantum fluctuations and how you really get from there to this power spectrum, which you see here, that uh, takes uh, a couple of lectures, uh, say maybe one whole lecture, five hour lecture course during such a school to really explain that. So that you have to believe me or look it up in uh, one of these uh, references I gave you. Now, but at least let me tell you what is really, what the meaning is on this plot of the various quantities. So this is here, this uh, quantity which is plotted on this axis. This is uh, the following. One looks at the sky and one looks now in different directions and one looks at, uh, say, uh, the temperature. Now the temperature is determined by the photon flux. What one has checked is that uh, this microwave background to very high accuracy has a Planck spectrum and therefore uh, it is, um, it is uh, once you know it's a Planck spectrum you can do the following. You can go to some frequency, check for consistency at a few frequencies and just measure the number of photons which come from that direction. So then this photon flux once you know it's a Planck spectrum, gives you the temperature. So that's what is done. And then you see now, if you vary the direction to which you look, you see very tiny variations in this uh, temperature. And uh, you can measure the temperature, or you can measure another quantity. You can measure, uh, say, the polarization of the photons, the flux of the photons, of polarized photons, which come from some dire uh, direction. 
that gives you other information for the so-called B modes, which we'll briefly come to. Now, uh, anyway, so what is uh, plotted here then is you then do the two-point correlation function. This is a temperature-temperature correlation function. You look in, say, two directions. And uh, then you do an analysis in terms of spherical harmonics. And then the Legendre polynomials, which enter their carriers multipole uh, label L. And you plot then um, these moments here as a function of L. And you get this very characteristic spectrum. And as you know, that contain, contains lots of important information on the amount of dark matter uh, from the relative height of these peaks, the amount of baryon asymmetry. From the position of this, you get that the universe is flat, and so on. Now, uh, so you have such power spectra. And uh, what goes into this is the following. If you really compute that, that's here an integral of a product of things. One is the so-called primordial power spectrum. This is what you calculate from inflation. And the other, the so-called transfer function. That tells you, and there's a lot of work in this transfer function, that, that tells you if you start with a certain initial power, then what do you really see in the end uh, as a temperature fluctuation when uh, the photons decouple? And that involves all the physics of uh, the, uh, the uh, plasma uh, before decoupling. Before the photons decouple, you have a plasma of, say, uh, charged uh, protons, of electrons, of photons, and which are in thermal contact. And then their interactions, uh, they, um, uh, these, um, if you now have density fluctuations, then uh, you get uh, the interactions which you have in these uh, plasmas, sort of the sound waves there, they uh, are then important for what in the end you see as temperature fluctuations. That's a big b business in many codes, analytically, quasi-analytically, numerical, which has been worked out now uh, for many years. And out of that, in the end, you get this uh, power spectrum. Now, uh, the remarkable thing is that the outcome here can be described, now the, say the physics between the primordial uh, fluctuations and what you see in the temperature fluctuations is something which in principle is known. One has to work it out, but in principle it's known. What is far as important is the input, the primordial uh, spectrum. That one characterized, if you look at the fluctuations in uh, say the metric, uh, then uh, you can have a scalar component and the tensor component. You can have different Lorentz contributions there. And uh, these are two kinds of fluctuations here characterized by these uh, quantities. And it turns out that uh, these, this input, this primordial fluctuations are almost flat. That means they depend, they almost don't depend on this wavelength, the, moment, the wave number here, or the corresponding wavelength, uh, they're almost constant, but there is a tiny slope. And uh, so this tiny slope is what you can calculate in inflation in the models. And what you can also calculate is a relative normalization of these two fluctuations. This is this little r, the so-called tensor, tensor to scalar ratio. OK, so this is just to explain what it is. Uh, and I cannot explain how you get there. But just, again, that's why these numbers are important. You have an s minus 1, which gives you the slope in one kind of uh, fluctuations, and nt, which is the slope in the tensor fluctuations. And this is a relative normalization. These are the three quantities which you have for these models. And now uh, you can go on and calculate. And this is from this latest paper of the Planck collaboration, which shows you how, Foshin, how different uh, models, how well different models do. So here you see now a plane. This is the tensor to scalar ratio, this little quantity r, which I just explained what it is, as a function, not a function. This is uh, uh, the. Uh, one axis in this plane is uh, this little r, and the other axis is the scalar spectral index. And uh, then 
what you see here are one and two sigma regions of what you get from the Planck data. The different colors here correspond to different data sets. So that's a complication we, we don't worry about. Just always look at the dark blue here and the light blue here. These are the two, re this is one sigma, this is two sigma, and now the question is whether the predictions for little r and ns lie, uh, say, in the one sigma or the two sigma region or not. And this is here compared for um, different models. For instance, the famous chaotic inflation, m squared phi squared, it gives, depending on whether for the number of e-folds you take 50 or 60, give you these two points. So you see that lies outside the one sigma and the two sigma region. So it's now really disfavored. That doesn't work. If you decrease the power here, yeah, so this was phi squared. If you decrease the power, say, to one, you get this. So this looks better. It is in the two sigma region, but also not in the one sigma region. Then uh, you get a band here. This is natural inflation. That still overlaps a little bit with the two sigma region, but it doesn't look that good. Anyway, the data may change a little bit. Don't worry. Yeah. So, uh, but this is the situation now. And then you see something down here, which looks very good. And this is a Starobinsky model. And uh, I will uh, come back to that. So this is this. And then there is something which uh, connects this chaotic inflation or interpolates between chaotic inflation and the Starobinsky model. This is indicated by these yellow lines, the so-called alpha attractors. I will also talk about that. Anyway, that's the situation. Now, uh, recent developments. Uh, of course, there are no key references now. There are also no reviews. I will just give a couple of examples. So I will give you one example from uh, small field inflation. In fact, something we have been working on because it has to be pushed uh, to, uh, I think, quite a detailed level. I will say something about the impact of the bicep data. And then I will show you what the potential problems are with large field inflation or what the status is of that if you embed that in supergravity. And uh, then I will discuss uh, the Starobinsky uh, model. And uh, OK, then I, I forgot to say what I do here. Well, you will uh, see. So that's uh, the status. Now, um, let me start with one um, small field inflation example. That's supersymmetric hybrid inflation. That's uh, the. Hybrid inflation also goes back. I gave you the earlier reference before. This is some work done for a while with this peep by these people. And uh, what is, I think, interesting about this is that this connects baryogenesis, inflation, and also uh, dark matter. So uh, you remember when we discussed leptogenesis yesterday, we had rather high temperatures. The typical temperature, say, was 10 to the 10 uh, GV. And uh, now, for many years, there is something which has been discussed a lot, the so-called Gravitino problem. You say, if you go to uh, supersymmetric theories and you have such high temperatures in the early universe, then there is a danger that you produce too many Gravitinos. And that, if the Gravitinos are stable, is a danger, and there are the dark matter, is a danger to have too much dark matter. If they are unstable and decay, then because they decay late, it gives you problems with uh, nuclear synthesis. So that's a Gravitino problem. On the other hand, uh, I mean, this has been calculated, this rate, and it is known that for numbers which you expect, say, in supergravity, a uh, Gravitino mass of 100 GeV, a Gravitino mass of a TeV, and now this reheating temperature, if you just multiply that together, then you get about a value of the observed dark matter. That means if uh, the... Um, temperature, sort of the maximal temperature in the early universe would be about that, what you have in leptogenesis, then maybe that would just fit together with uh, um, uh, what you need for dark matter. 
But then why should that be? I mean, how can it be, let's say, the maximal temperature which you have in the early universe is about the temperature of leptogenesis? Now, uh, there is a funny thing. You remember, or maybe a curiosity, but maybe also interesting. Uh, you remember yesterday that the typical number of the heavy neutrino which made leptogenesis was uh, about 10 to the 10 GeV, and this effective neutrino mass was about 0.01 EV. If you calculate the de then the decay width of this heavy neutrino, you find it's uh, 10 to the 3 GeV. Now imagine uh, the evolution of the universe is such that you go through a phase where, say, after inflation, uh, you are dominated for a while, uh, the energy density is dominated for a while by, uh, the, uh, by, by, the by the mass density of uh, such heavy neutrinos. Then uh, you, their decays would reheat the universe and give you, uh, would be crucial for the reheating process. And then you can compute what the reheating temperature is. That means up to which temperature you would reheat uh, the universe. And you find out that that temperature is about 10 to the 10 GeV. So that means uh, if you have such a scenario in cosmology, then maybe you can really understand why uh, the maximal temperature of the universe is such that you can also explain the dark matter in terms of gravitinos. Now, uh, how does uh, this work? In fact, you can make a model like this. Not a model, but uh, I would say in high width inflation, that picture can be naturally realized. So you start now from uh, superpotential, or that you know now from the lectures of Marcus Luthi. This is what I had yesterday uh, written without superfields, just for fermions and Higgses. You have in unification, here's these couplings of these 10 plates uh, to, uh, and five star plates to two Higgs fields. And this is a term for the right-handed neutrinos. Now what happens in, uh, in supersymmetry is the following. If you want to break uh, to get also, as you get the masses for these fields, the mass of these heavy right-handed neutrinos, if you want to get them from spontaneous symmetry breaking, you need a field whose vacuum expectation value breaks B minus L. That's denoted here as this. And then <coughs> to realize that in supersymmetry, you need a partner field, a second one, and you need a singlet which uh, tells you in the end that the vacuum expectation values are given by this VEF, which you need for B minus L breaking. So this superpotential was first sort of the, the basic superpotential for discussing symmetry breaking first used by Fayet uh, many years ago for SU2 breaking. This is well known. Now it happens that uh, what you then have, uh, this superpotential for quarks and leptons, the usual neutrino couplings and so on, and this one, this is just uh, the superpotential of hybrid inflation, which was uh, considered independent of this uh, before. So that means if you start from neutrino physics and you want to uh, spontaneously break B minus L, then uh, the superpotential for B minus L breaking gives you automatically an inflaton candidate, namely the singlet, and uh, the scenario of hybrid inflation. Now, what is interesting about this is that you don't have any parameters. In fact, all the parameters here are essentially fixed from the masses and from leptogenesis. So you have one more here for this uh, strength. And just this sort of minimal supersymmetric framework, including a spontaneous breaking of barrier minus lepton number, includes uh, what you need in cosmology now altogether, namely inflation, leptogenesis, and dark matter. Now, uh, you get now from this the typical potential of hybrid inflation, which is well known. Uh, this is the potential now as a function on the one hand of this uh, field S, this uh, which breaks the symmetry, and the inflaton field here, which moves in this direction. And the characteristic feature of hybrid inflation is that the inflaton in the inflaton direction, the potential is very flat. And uh, in the other, uh, the curvature changes. So at early times, 
the symmetry breaking field, the field which breaks B minus L symmetry, has a steep potential, and then it becomes flatter and flatter, and eventually the curvature becomes negative. It's like a second order phase transition, and uh, you get a spontaneous symmetry breaking. And in this spontaneous symmetry breaking, that has been well studied. Uh, you have a process which is uh, called tachyonic preheating. So you generate rather quickly. Uh, you go from a homogeneous inflationary phase to the phase of B minus L breaking. In fact, the situation has been even simulated on the lattice by these people already for a simplified model a number of years ago. And this shows you how the expectation value of the field breaking B minus L approaches its equilibrium value. And this shows you during this process, during this process of tachyonic preheating, what kind of particles you produce. And uh, these particles as a function of their momentum. And you see sort of this is all, uh, this is big, only at small momenta. So what you essentially produce during this process is many particles which are rather soft. <clears throat> now, uh, starting from here, you can then uh, work out after this stage of tachyonic preheating. You remember in the, uh, if you think back yesterday, we had this uh, plot where um, the co-moving uh, Hubble radius was shown as a function of the scale factor, which is essentially time. And first it went down and then up again. So the point at the bottom is the point where inflation ends and where the hot Big Bang starts. And that is here. Okay? So with this method of tachyonic preheating, you can then calculate uh, the abundances of your particles. And uh, what comes out of this phase transition at the end of inflation, and then after that, uh, <clears throat> you can study the time evolution of the system during the hot Big Bang by means of standard Boltzmann equations. But you have a couple of particles, and you have to look at the interactions. And But these are known techniques. And that was done. You can look at uh, this chain of Boltzmann equations and write a code for that and solve these equations and so on. And then you find what the time evolution of the system is. In the beginning, uh, the energy density is dominated by these heavy scalars uh, <coughs> corresponding uh, to B minus L breaking, which you uh, produce. And then uh, you have also, this is a logarithmic scale, you have also contributions immediately from radiation, you have some right-handed neutrinos, you, uh, then you have gravitinos from the beginning. But then uh, more and more during decays, more and more energy is pumped into the plasma from slowly decaying heavy particles, which break B minus L, and uh, then uh, the temperature increases, and then, so you get a shift from an equation of state which is matter-dominated to one which is radiation-dominated. And in the end, uh, the hot Big Bang starts. Here it's dominated just by radiation, but as a cause of the various processes which took place in the plasma, you have also generated an asymmetry in B minus A, and uh, you have generated a gravitino number density. So this is what gives you dark matter, and this is what gives you the barrier asymmetry in the way discussed yesterday by uh, leptogenesis. Actually, just a curiosity, what is interesting is that during this period, this transition period, from uh, so the first time scales uh, after the end of inflation, the temperature of the system essentially does not change. I mean, you shift the distribution of the energy density from matter to radiation, but the temperature uh, remains more or less constant, which makes the calculations reliable. So you have uh, essentially a plateau. Now, uh, you can work all this out, and uh, that's a lot of stuff, and I just give you some uh, results for that. There are weak, but there are implications also for LHC physics. And that depends on what the dark matter is. 
So that matter here uh, comes from gravitinos, and there are still two possibilities depending on the masses of the gravitinos. Either uh, the gravitinos themselves are the dark matter. In this case here, you get a lower bound on the gravitino mass of about uh, 10 GeV uh, as a function of this effective neutrino mass, and that gives you in LHC phenomenology uh, some constraints. Alternatively, if you have heavier gravitinos, say 100 TeV, they can decay into Higgsinos or Winos, and then you have neutralino uh, dark matter, non-thermally produced, with, and what this uh, picture then gives you is upper bounds on uh, the masses of these particles. So this is something to be searched for at uh, LHC. Now, uh, these models were believed for a long time to uh, have some problem, namely uh, that these hybrid inflation models could not really get the right spectral index of 0.96. It was believed that the spectral index is always higher, and uh, so as inflationary models, they were not so uh, good. However, it turns out that if you look at that more closely, and if you take into account the effect of supersymmetry breaking, then uh, the inflationary model is significantly modified and you can also get uh, the right uh, spectral index. So uh, let me just tell you in supergravity, if you work it out, you know now from Marcus Luthi's uh, lectures uh, what the scalar potential is in such a theory. You have basically a constant that what drives inflation. You have a logarithmic correction to that, that what gives you a little slope and makes the inflaton field move. You have a supergravity correction, and then you have here something which is proportional to m3 halves, the gravitino mass, which generates, in fact, a linear term in uh, the scalar potential. And that makes uh, the uh, hybrid turns the hybrid inflation model into a two-field model of inflation. You can work that out. You have now trajectories. Uh, you have a complex inflaton field with a real and uh, imaginary component, and in this plane, inflationary trajectories on which inflation uh, proceeds are now given by certain lines. And that means now that an observable like uh, the scalar spectral index depends on the trajectory on which inflation proceeds. That means on the initial condition. And there are a couple of trajectories here if you move to the right for which, in fact, you get, do get the right uh, spectral index, 0.96. And uh, if you further uh, pursue that, there was also another problem which was often mentioned, that in hybrid inflation models, there's a danger that you produce too many cosmic strings. And uh, cosmic strings are in principle interesting because it's something you can also look for in observation. Uh, but if you have too many of them, uh, that's also excluded. Now, it turns out, if you are in a parameter space, this is this coupling lambda of this B minus L breaking part, and this is uh, the VEF of B minus L breaking, then uh, the region here in parameter space where the spectral index comes out right is this green band. And you see uh, that then the constraint for, which comes from cosmic string production is automatically satisfied. So uh, this is just an example of hybrid inflation, which has been worked out to some detail, in fact, with some effort over a while. And uh, about a year ago, we were about to finish, uh, to, to publish, uh, say, the uh, latest paper in a series of all that. And uh, the spectral index, uh, sorry, the tensor scalar ratio, which you get here, is about, uh, for that you find that it has to be smaller than about 10 to the minus 6. So at the time when we were essentially finished, the bicep paper came out. Okay, so we had this prediction of 10 to the minus 6, and then there were these bicep data that uh, you may have seen. I'm sure you have seen that or heard a colloquium uh, on that, where uh, the indication was uh, that this uh, tensor to scalar ratio was 0.2, which would mean that all the stuff which I showed you so far was irrelevant. 
the data look very convincing. So it seemed that these small field deflationary models were sort of ruled out. And one needed large field models like in chaotic inflation or alternatives. And uh, <clears throat> OK. For reasons of time, let me not really spend on that. You have seen that. Or uh, this is a cosmology part to explain what here E modes and B modes are. You get a world pattern of uh, polarization lines down here. And here you get tangential or uh, radial uh, polarization pattern. I will not uh, explain that here. You can find a nice discussion of that also in this review by Baumann, how this pattern emerges. Let me just tell you what the present situation is with that. This BICEP paper caused a lot of activity, uh, well, I think, among uh, the experimenters, I think, to find out what is true, among the other collaborations, and also among the theorists. Now, to find out whether one could construct large field models, which uh, were uh, nice and theoretically acceptable. So I'll discuss some of that now. But first, let me mention what the present experimental situation is. Here, uh, in fact, uh, as you may know, there was, uh, earlier this year, there was a joint uh, publication from BICEP, this BICEP collaboration, and PLUNK on the status of this B-mode signal. And the problem in this B-mode signal is that uh, these polarization patterns, which you see there, you can get, uh, on the one hand, from primordial uh, tensor fluctuations, but you can also get it from dust. So the question is on the wave between uh, the last scattering surface of the CMB and today, how much dust has there been? And uh, the bicep had collaboration had assumed that there was essentially no dust. And Planck now had a dust map. Uh, and so they tried to combine uh, their information and to extract from that um, a reduced uh, data set. So here's the points which you see here. Uh, they are, uh, that is um, the bicep data without the dust subtraction. What you see here, the points below, is what you get if the dust is subtracted. And the red line is a theoretical prediction from, for this um, B-mode contribution if you just include so-called lensing contributions. Now, so you see uh, that is uh, rather well uh, consistent. So there is no, at the moment, looking at this, there is no, you don't really have to worry about these B-modes and large field inflation anymore. On the other hand, they also made a statistical analysis, these collaborations, and came to the conclusion that there is almost a two sigma effect which uh, remains. This is a likelihood plot and the preferred value uh, for uh, this tensor to scalar ratio is in fact about 0.05. So maybe there is still hope and maybe there still is something in the data. So I think this remains a very important and hot topic, and we can hope maybe still uh, during this year for some more information, for sure within the next few years. Uh, and it would be wonderful if um, something would be uh, found. But at the moment, there is no evidence, really, and therefore the small field inflationary models are still OK. So this brings me now to an example, one example, which I want to discuss concerning large field inflation. And uh, large field inflation is, uh, say, the typical example is chaotic inflation in squared phi squared. You want, if you get these large field values, you want to embed it in uh, supergravity. And in fact, uh, a lot of work on that has recently been done in the context also of string theory. Because people say, if I get such large field values. I have to know about uh, the ultraviolet completion of the theory. And um, so I should do some string theory. And a number of string models have been constructed for that. Now, what that means is that at the end of the day, which I mean, first, already a number of years ago, there was axion monodromy by Silverstein and Westphal. There were aligned axions. There, is, um, there are now various models in F-theory by a number of groups. So there's a lot of interesting activity. 
But, what, but strings uh, theory, as you know, is complicated. And you always can study only certain aspects of that. And what that boils down to in the end is that you make certain assumptions on your compactification manifold, on the stabilization of moduli, and so on. And in the end, you are left with an effective supergravity description of your inflaton field. That's what you do in the end. So you, in the end, you do some supergravity model. Now, what we were interested in was the following. If you, this large uh, field inflation models are realized, then the energy density during inflation is large. It's of the order of the gut uh, scale to the fourth power, this energy density. And then you really have to worry about the destabilization of moduli, the supersymmetry breaking, and so on. And now the simplest model you can, uh, or the simplest scenario which you can study is in fact where you have, say, at least the volume uh, modulus of your uh, manifold of which you compactify and uh, supersymmetry breaking fields, field which brings you from an anti de Sitter vacuum, which we typically have uh, to start from, back to Minkowski space, and then you have your inflaton. Now, um, so we studied that for a couple of, for some examples of uh, moduli stabilization, and I'll just illustrate that by one example, maybe the most well known example for modulus stabilization, which is the KKLT mechanism. There you know you have, uh, or you may not know, or I don't know whether uh, Marcus Lutti had time enough to uh, discuss it, but it's sort of a well known model in supergravity how to stabilize such a modulus field. You have a certain Kähler potential there, which is this. And then you have a superpotential, which is this. And then uh, you, uh, well, you study the stabilization. Uh, first, what you get is a so-called anti, if you just take these things, you get an anti de Sitter vacuum down here. Then you need something to uh, an uplift mechanism which moves you up back here to Minkowski space. And one thing which you can do is you can use a Polony field which means that you add essentially such a term uh, to the potential, and then you, are, you get something like this. So uh, that means if you have a potential like this, you need, uh, you have a modulus field, and you have something for supersymmetry breaking. Then you add the, uh, uh, you add the inflaton. And for the inflaton, uh, you also need a Kähler potential, and uh, one which you essentially need for these large field models is something which was proposed by, uh, by uh, Yanagida and friends a number of years ago, where you have for this inflaton field uh, a shift symmetry. So putting this together, you can then work this out and see what happens, and for which parameters and field values the thing is consistent. And uh, what you find in this case is something a little bit unusual. You can, first of all, you need large supersymmetry breaking. So no hope uh, to see then anything at the LHC. The uh, gravitino mass here, which you obtain, should be larger than about 10 to the 14 GeV. So you get supersymmetry breaking somewhat below the scale of grand unification. And the potential here in the plane of modulus and uh, inflaton looks like this. So you have here a valley for the inflaton, but this valley uh, disappears for some field value. You can't really read that, I think, here. This is, uh, should be a field value of about 20 units of the Planck mass for the inflaton field. If you have such large field values, then the local minimum for the modulus disappears. You cannot stabilize anymore your modulus. And on the way up here, this chaotic inflation potential is flat. You get a co correction term which is negative and has a higher power in phi. So uh, if you then work this out, how inflation would look like, it would mean that the potential goes like this, and then this correction becomes important. You never reach the top here uh, of this potential where this becomes flat, because settle point, because uh, already before uh, the minimum for uh, the modulus disappears. So uh, 
if you are, want to have together modular stabilization and uh, large field inflation, you have to be very careful and it becomes difficult. The spectral index comes out nice and uh, the tensor to scalar ratio is um, a little big, but still okay. So phenomenologically, these things uh, could work. You can summarize uh, these. Um, you can summarize these uh, uh, results also for the other, mold, other molds in the following: this effect of flattening of these potentials due to modular effects is uh, generic that uh, you always find in all these molds, and then you can compare the um, the situation with uh, the Planck data the predictions with the Planck data. This is again this plane of R, the tensor to scalar ratio and the scalar spectral index. And these are the Planck data, one and two sigma regions. And um, you, for comparison, what you have here, this purple band is what you get in natural inflation. Uh, these models, which I discussed now, chaotic inflation with moduli effect, are this green band, so similar to this natural inflation. And then, for comparison, power potentials for different powers give you this band. So up here, you have chaotic inflation, and then smaller powers you have down here. And so that gives you this band. Now, there is one important piece of uh, information which I should uh, give you, to be honest. I mean, when uh, this plot was made uh, that was in January this year, all that was available were uh, the published Planck data at that time. And there, this was a one sigma region, and this was two sigma region. And so uh, things looked reasonably compatible. In the meantime, now the uh, Planck data have been, the latest Planck data are available. And essentially what happened is that the old uh, one sigma region now became the two sigma region. So that means, uh, say, the predictions of these models which I discussed here and also all the uh, power potential large field models look a little bit uh, disfavored. I mean, they look, they are outside of the two sigma region. So we will see what happens, either with the further development of these models or with the change uh, in data. But this is uh, status. OK, so I've discussed two aspects now. Uh, say, a typical small field model with hybrid inflation type model with implications, connections to dark matter, and diagenesis, and now some aspects of a large field inflationary model. Now let me explain uh, to you what the uh, Starobinsky model is, which is uh, somewhat intriguing, I think, although it's not so clear what it means. Uh, somehow, uh, the, this model is its not explicitly written, but it's essentially contained in a paper by Starobinsky in 1980, maybe one of the first papers on inflation at all on which then, which was then also the basis for Shibisov and Mukhanov to calculate the density fluctuations. Now, that paper just looks at a modified gravity Lagrangian. So it takes this, and then instead of just the einstein hilbert term here, it takes R minus an R squared term. And for dimensional reasons, a scale is needed here. Now, there is a standard thing in gravity used in many uh, circumstances, namely you can do a vile escalation, rescaling, a vile rescaling. That means you switch from the metric G to a metric G to a metric uh, G twiddle times phi. Then you can just work out what happens with this Lagrangian, and it is just an identity that you get this Lagrangian. Now, in fact, what you know is uh, if you have an R squared term, if, if the Lagrangian has just, uh, the Einstein, the gravity Lagrangian has just R, then you have a Lagrangian which is uh, quadratic 
in um, time derivatives. If you add uh, R squared, then you get something which has four time derivatives, and you know, and it is known that uh, then there are more propagating degrees of freedom. And in fact, you get one more, you get a scalar degrees of freedom. And to make that manifest, is, that's a well-known technique to rewrite such a Lagrangian uh, in terms of uh, the metric and this additional field. In fact, you can do it not just for this, but you can do it for any function f of r. And then what you get is you get the Einstein term for uh, the modified uh, metric, and you get in, an, in addition here uh, a scalar, which has a non-canonical kinetic, non kinetic term, and some potential. Now you can uh, make a field transformation such that the scalar field has a canonical kinetic term. That is such a field redefinition here. And if you now rewrite the Lagrangian in terms of, this should be here, the, the small phi, in terms of the field which has canonical kinetic term, then the potential is this. So. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, say, m squared, the scale, times m Planck squared. And uh, then you have this, and then you have an exponential squared. So um, now you see what this potential does, is uh, this potential um, for large field values goes to a constant. Now, this here really has a slope. It goes up to, uh, it's concave, I think. And the other, uh, goes like this. So you go to a constant. And you reach a certain plateau. In fact, that's uh, similar to uh, hybrid inflation. In hybrid inflation for very large field values, you also reach a, a plateau. Well, it depends on how you do hybrid inflation. If you do, I should say, uh, if you do uh, this hybrid inflation model, which I described to you, then the potential will increase logarithmically at very large values. But whether that happens or not depends really on the kinetic term. What has been discussed is, uh, say, D-term hybrid inflation in connection, I have no time to discuss that here, but in connection with superconformal symmetry. Then you have a different uh, Keller potential for this field. You get a different kinetic term. And in such models, in fact, it happens that the potential asymptotically also goes to a constant, to a plateau. And then you get some modification of that. And uh, then uh, this is uh, something which I had no time to discuss, but then you also effectively get this potential. And one uh, model which has been discussed a lot, uh, where you also get such a potential, is Higgs inflation. In Higgs inflation, if you add to the Lagrangian uh, a term which is, say, the Higgs potential uh, squared times uh, some factor, which is very big, then uh, you can also, by means of field redefinition, transform this into such a potential. So it's quite uh, a curious potential. And what is interesting is here it comes out just from uh, this second term in gravity, which you add. And so that may make you think whether this has some universal property. I mean, you can uh, derive this kind of potential in, from a couple of other explicit models. 
you can get this, and uh, then you can rewrite it this way. Now you can work out, and because of this plateau, uh, this model is a perfect model of inflation. Uh, inflation, uh, you know, uh, starts somewhere here, and then it usually ends somewhere here, where uh, the slow roll uh, conditions are no longer satisfied. And you can work out uh, what the predictions are for this model. You get, in fact, what is interesting, you get the scalar spectral index is the same as for a chaotic inflation. It is this, which works nicely. The tensor scalar ratio is smaller. It's this value. And so uh, significantly smaller than chaotic inflation. But it may be not impossible to reach it, say, within the next 10 years, depending on what people are doing. But if something like this, if this would be true, then maybe it could also uh, be realized. Now, it also has just one parameter here, the model. So it is somewhat intriguing. It is somehow, uh, I mean, if you are very naive, it's sort of the first model ever written down, and it's now the one which works best. But you, of course, you still have to ask the question, why is this, and what is the significance of that? Is this just uh, an accident uh, or not? Now, uh, that brings me finally uh, to a little uh, I don't know, curiosity or something, but a paper, Escher in the Sky, written recently uh, by uh, Carlos and Linde, which in fact interpolates between chaotic inflation and the Starobinsky model. So um, you see, this is again uh, this plane, which you now see in all these inflationary models where uh, you have uh, the tensor to scalar ratio here and the scalar spectral index here, and these blue line contours here, the one and two sigma region of the Planck data. Now, uh, as we saw already on a, in a previous plot, chaotic inflation uh, you have uh, here, m squared phi squared, and the Starobinsky model down here. Actually, I should say one has to be careful with this, because uh, if I say the Starobinsky model is down here, it has to do with the scale. Of course, this is a, a linear scale. And of course, you, you everything which is smaller than, say, uh, 0.05 looks like 0 here. But of course, there are many, many uh, different possibilities of what is the value of r uh, little r really is. <clears throat> now, uh, so there what you can do is uh, you can write down now uh, you can look at say chaotic inflation, however with a non-minimal kinetic term. So the minimal uh, kinetic term would just be uh, d phi squared, but you can just multiply it by this. In fact, a structure like this you get in all these models with superconformal symmetry you get uh, a denominator like this. And uh, it has a feature that uh, the field range in these models is limited. Uh, you see, if you, of course, you, you want to have phi equals 0 as a possibility, but you can make phi not too big. Otherwise, you hit the singularity here. And uh, so you, the field value of phi is uh, as a boundary. So this, uh, you can now again do the trick which we did by the Starobinsky model. You can do essentially as here. You can do a field redefinition, which looks almost exactly like this one. And then uh, this Lagrangian, in terms of the field with the canonic, canonical kinetic term, looks like this. You have this and this. As then you have a tangent uh, hyperbolic tangent of the sign, the same as in the Starobinsky model. And you have here m squared multiplied by alpha. The phenomenology is fine. In fact, uh, independent of alpha, the scalar spectral index is always 1 minus 2 over n, which is this 0.96. So it works very well. 
therefore you get here a straight line. And uh, this value of R, however, the density scalar ratio, now depends on alpha. You see, if uh, alpha is 1, you get what I showed you previously. Uh, you get uh, 12 over n squared, which we had. If you, you can pick also a value for alpha, where you get the prediction of chaotic inflation and everything in between. So uh, you get such a line. I mean, one should say, however, that the model interpolates not just between these two points. It could go up also here and could go down further here to smaller values. But it's a class of potentials which uh, have as two points chaotic inflation and the Staubinsky model. Now, what is, uh, but what does that mean? And now what is, ni what is uh, interesting in um, about this paper, I've never seen before on the archive a paper with so many nice uh, colorful pictures as you can find them here. And uh, what they now argue, that's the title Asher in the Sky, is that in fact that is essentially the non-canonical kinetic term. Where does it come from? So, so the question is, what is the meaning of this parameter alpha? And what you can now do is this is just uh, a certain metric here, of course, uh, this factor which we had for this uh, kinetic term, and it corresponds to uh, a metric uh, of a, a hyperbolic, just uh, two-dimensional hyperbolic space, as you usually learn what it is when you study, um, when you do general relativity, and you want to work out uh, maximal symmetric spaces then for you get either the sphere as a compact uh, space or the hyperboloid. And the hyperboloid is characterized by uh, the distance here from the bottom to here. And uh, that's, but now uh, this, uh, so this hyperbolic uh, geometry has now one interesting thing, uh, which is uh, you can map the whole hyperboloid to a disk in a certain way by a certain projection. And this disk is called uh, Poincaré's disk. OK. This is uh, just a well-known result in mathematics. And in fact, uh, the radius of this uh, is a free parameter. Is the radius of this disk. And it's related to uh, the distance from here to here. And now there is uh, this. Uh, Dutch artist, Escher, who apparently made for all kinds of mathematical uh, constructions, uh, he made some interesting pictures. And uh, they are very colorful. And uh, you can find the references in this paper by Carlos and Linde, where to find uh, these pictures and how they are made and what the story is behind them and so on. So in fact, uh, he made a picture for the Poincaré disk. Uh, this, uh, which should reflect somehow the Poincaré disk, this artist, which is this picture. This, I don't know what to say about the picture. Anyway, this is just a picture. And uh, if you are interested, look up the paper. You can see all the other pictures. And uh, well, I hope that looking at this and thinking a little bit about the geometry, maybe of the metric, the kinetic term, uh, what it could possibly mean for, for inflation and so on, that this may uh, inspire your future work uh, about the early universe. So that brings me to the end of my lecture.